Do you struggle with bad sleep due to snoring? Do you know breathing better during the day and at night time can help you sleep better? I'm Dr. Michael Lee from Seattle, helping you to breathe better so you can feel better. In this interview with Dr. Bakal, we will discuss how your mouth and teeth and everywhere in between can help you breathe better for better sleep and better health. If you're new here, please remember to subscribe to our channel right there. So let's get right into it. Welcome, Dr. Bakal. Uh, thank you for your time today uh, to basically share your knowledge uh, with our audience about uh, what you do. So without further ado, can you tell us a little bit about yourself personally and professionally? Sure, my pleasure. And thanks for having me today. Um, I'm a board certified orthodontist and periodontist. I have a practice in Seattle and Bellevue. And our, we are an orthodontic practice. We do braces, we do Invisalign, but we have a particular interest in skeletal growth and development and airway. So we look very closely at how the hard tissue and the soft tissue plays into things like sleep apnea and even uh, sleep disorder breathing, both in children and adults. Yep, so uh, as I shared during the intro earlier, so I'm a patient of yours as well. And uh, being a new dad, I'm always looking for ways to maximize my sleep. And um, so again, my sleep study review, I have some upper airway uh, obstructions and that's what led me to you to help me open up my upper airway. So um, can you share with uh, us like, because earlier during the uh, pre-recording, you know, we talk about like how a lot of these developmental changes in us affect someone like myself right now to have this, you know, breathing problem. So can you tell us a little bit more about that, Dr. Bakat? Sure, well, we, we don't see babies in our practice, but one of our interests is sort of how do the malocclusions develop that we see every day? So if we think back to breastfeeding, breastfeeding is the first thing that kicked off growth and development. It's the tongue coming up into the roof of the mouth is what drives the growth of the upper jaw. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So the wider the upper jaw, the easier it is for us to breathe through our nose. Uh, we have to, as babies, have full range of motion, not only in the front, but in the back of the tongue in order to start to shape the palate at a very young age. The tongue coming up and forward also, also drives the growth of both jaws forward. Mm -hmm. And so new research is actually linking underbites and overbites with things like nasal respiratory obstruction. So a child with adenoids and tonsils, a child that's mouth breathing is gonna have things like underbite, overbite, crossbite, open bite, gummy smile. All of these things can actually be traced back to the way we breathe and the way we posture our tongue, the way we hold our body, the way we hold our lower jaw. So a lot of the work you do with body, with posture, this is all, it's all tied together. And so when we see an adult then with things like airway obstruction, we want to trace back to what, what so we want to try to identify some of that etiology when we think about our treatment plan. Which, uh, when I first uh, do my research on how to help myself with the airway, I find it quite interesting and intriguing, like how orthodontists can think about upper airway. So can you share with our audience, like what got you interested in doing what you do? Sure. Um, so the way I got into this in 2013, I went to a lecture given by a prosthodontist about airway issues and how we as dentists can identify things. And I was blown away. Um, I saw tons of adults that had sleep apnea and I looked at all these photos of adults with sleep apnea and I thought to myself, these are all orthodontic issues. And I, I really went head first into the literature, but it wasn't orthodontic literature, it was sleep literature, ENT literature, literature that we weren't learning about in school, but it's all tied together. And so when we think about rehabilitating a patient, um, we think about structure, function, and behavior. So it, in orthodontics, we do structure. We look at bones, how, how wide are the jaws? Are the jaws forward enough? Um, is there room for the tongue? Um, function is, can we move the tongue? Can we breathe through our nose? So deviated septum, enlarged turbinates, these sorts of things would impede function. Tongue ties would impede function. And then behavior is, 
can we do it? Can or can we learn to do it on a day-to-day -day basis? So getting that tongue up and forward, being a more efficient nasal breather, keeping lips together, and it, it all has to happen together. And to all my audience and to my patients, we're watching this. Sounds a lot like the, you know, the rehab we do for low back pain or shoulder pain. It's quite fascinating. So now for myself, uh, you know, I'm in the second week of my Invisalign to open up my airway. So can you tell uh, our audience a little bit more about like, how does the orthodontic work for someone like myself, an adult, to change the structure and how that help reverse some of the things that we may miss during our earlier life? Um, so it, it goes back to, we have to sort of try to identify the etiology. So at what point does any given patient have a blockage? So if we, if we figure out that the blockage really is nasal, we try to increase nasal breathing. So that might include maxillary expansion. The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So the wider we can, the more we can widen the maxilla, the more we can improve nasal breathing. If the issue is posterior, so pharyngeal airway space, trying to create more space inside the mouth to get the tongue up and forward. So that would be a combination of expansion with myofunctional therapy, potentially also a tongue tie release. Um, so trying to understand where on this pathway we have the blockage. Gotcha. Can you elaborate on a little bit more like when a patient comes to you, like how would you identify those causes of problems? Um, so health history, mm -hmm. asking, asking good questions. And um, we take Wait. a 3D x-ray um, you've seen our 3D x-ray machine. Yes. And, um, the 3D x-ray really shows us what's going on in the nasal passages. So we can identify things like a deviated septum. We might pick up things like um, sinusitis or, or enlarged turbinates as well. I'm not an ENT. I, I, don't, I don't read like an, like an ear, nose, and throat doctor would read an x-ray, but I can at least get a sense of what's going on and make that referral. So we work very closely with our ENT colleagues. If there is something that needs to be looked at, we definitely refer for ear, nose, and throat evaluation. Um, we look at the soft palate, we look at the adenoids, um, we look at base of tongue, we look at tonsils, we look at how much space there is in the mouth. And then with our intraoral exam, we look at tongue mobility we look at teeth, we look at how much room there is for to move the teeth within the bony housing. So for example, someone with a lot of gum recession, we're gonna have to think about how that plays into the treatment plan as well. Gotcha. I mean, like, uh, uh, for my audience and for patients, you know, you've been heard me talking about, you know, the importance of breathing, because in a line of work, uh, we always find out like, if someone just cannot breathe or have a hard time breathing, like. That's pretty much the biggest compensation need for the body to do all this crazy compensation just to get a breath. And what really intrigued me to interview Dr. Bacal, uh, Bacal this time is because I find a lot of things we keep doing for patients like, okay, posture and whatnot, but always see some patients they always just got stuck. Like they literally cannot breathe. And then uh, after doing all the sleep study and whatnot, like again, I land in, um, Dr. Bacow's clinic and really opened my eyes like what other things can do with a patient and in my own humble opinion like something actually can really help them permanently because they, now they can finally breathe so they can stop using the neck just to get a gaps of air you know they can finally use that nasal breathing we trigger the diaphragm and that whole domino effect is just phenomenal now can you tell us a little bit more about like as most folks will relate orthodontists like braces but like can you tell them a little bit more about like, you mentioned about the you know, upper jar expansion. How does that work? So can you give me a little, give our audience a little glimpse of like, what does that entail anyway? Sure, so if you think about the bones in the head, they meet at these, their plates and they meet at sutures. <laughs> yep. um, a suture is an adaptive site. So a baby, it's gonna be wide open. And so the skull, when a brain, when the brain grows, it pushes on the sutures and that's what grows the, the, the skull. The upper jaw is two pieces of bone. It meets in the middle and it goes all the way up. It has connections here at the zygomatic arch and then all the way up into the nose and then posteriorly um, in the back as well. So the tongue pushing up 
is what drives the growth of the upper jaw in a child. In an adult, when we have a narrow maxilla, we can influence that suture, but it takes a great deal of force. And so to open up the suture in an adult, we often use uh, a special appliance that anchors to the bone itself. So we place two pins on each side of the mid palatal suture and it has a jack screw. And we can slowly, slowly non-surgically widen the suture. Our oldest patient we've done to, to date is a 66 year old female, um, non-surgically. But some of our adult male patients do require surgical intervention because the bone is more solid. So depending on the age and the presentation of the patient, we can widen that upper jaw, we can widen the floor of the nose, we can widen the internal nasal valve, and all those things can help improve nasal breathing. Non, um, sometimes non-surgically, sometimes with a small surgery. If we want to, um, the other issue, sometimes we have a deficient upper or lower jaw. Sometimes in those cases, we do include a surgical correction for adults. Uh, for children, we focus more on trying to get growth going in the right direction. Thank you. Now for those, uh, I know surgery is always a little scary word. Now can you tell us a little bit more about like, you know, what actually you have me do, like the Invisalign? So, you know, so some other, I guess, non-surgical options that you do too? Sure, sure. So, if, if we're really focusing on creating tongue space, um, just creating dental arch development can, can a, a little bit goes a long way. So that's what we're doing together is widening, developing those arches, uprighting teeth, creating more space for the tongue. So um, really targeting, opening up back here by creating more space here. So the, the base of the tongue um, fills the posterior pharyngeal airway space. So the more we can give it room to come up and forward. I, I think of the tongue like a water balloon. It, it's a fixed entity. And so the more space we can create for it and then also myofunctional therapy, tongue tie release, all of that helps get it out of the back of the throat. Um, I know you're gonna have a myofunctional therapist on the show, but I, I, I think about the isotonic isometric exercises that are included with myofunctional therapy and the importance of that to keep the airway open uh, as another piece to what we do. We create the space, but then we also need um, the the muscle tone to help get it there. Yes, uh, so just like when we tell our patients, our audience, uh, you know, function affects structure, structure affect functions. So um, so for those who haven't uh, watched our other episode with the myofunctional uh, therapist, Emily, so actually, you know, why don't Dr. Buckel here? So, for those who are not familiar with myofunctional therapy, can you share with the audience what is this anyway? Sure. Well, I when I think about physical therapy, when I think about the work you do, I think about fascia. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about muscle tendons, fascia, and so I think about the same with the tongue. Mm -hmm. And so, the more flexibility, mobility we can create with the tongue, the more we can tone the muscles, strengthen the muscles in the airway, the more we can keep it open. Um, sleep apnea is often caused by a collapse of the of the pharyngeal airway space. It's all a big mus, it's all muscle back here. It's not necessarily supported by any particular bone, and so having creating that strength to to maintain it to keep it open is really key. Um, and and I and that's the work I think the work you're doing with Emily, the work that a myofunctional therapist does. Yes, uh, what I know about this world that I wasn't aware of prior to 2020 is, uh, yeah, how similar with just body works and you know like again muscles drive on the I mean, put force on the structures and how do we actually tone those muscles? Yes, tongue is a big muscle. How that to help tone the rest of the airway has been amazing to me. Uh, I was sharing with uh, on the other video after even having some uh, oral training or posture better, that actually helps me better to walk up and downstairs because I'm on the eighth floor just like you. Uh, I walk up and downstairs all the time uh, just by having my tongue in a better oral posture. I actually find myself catching my breath less just going up and downstairs. Amazing, amazing. Doc, can you share with us, like, so what kind of, like, you know, uh, patients or physical conditions that actually, you know, 
that people seek you out for treatment? Uh, we we do crowding, so braces, Invisalign, just your everyday crowding. Um, mm -hmm. For our pediatric patients, we do a lot of growth and growth guidance. So looking at what what's causing the malocclusion at a pretty young age and trying to get growth on track doing things to try to expand the arches, get breathing going in the right direction, identifying those tongue ties early, getting myofunctional therapy going in the right direction early to avoid things, hopefully not always like extractions, although extractions in and of themselves are not necessarily bad, trying to develop those arches to create more space for the teeth. Um, and then in adults, once again, trying to identify those etiologic factors, trying to improve sleep and breathing by developing the arches. And of course, like the work you do, we work very much with an interdisciplinary team. So sometimes we include referrals to sleep medicine, referrals to ENT, referrals to myofunctional therapy, referrals to surgeons who are very closely with our dental colleagues as well. So um, it, it, it really takes a team approach. Which I appreciate because uh, I always say like, you know, it's whatever best for the patients. And I love just how comprehensive, you know, your treatment has been, you know, as a patient myself. So I really appreciate that. Now, if you're going to be giving one tip, like, because most of the audience, uh, you know, I would like to say whoever land on this video would have probably some sort of like sleep problem, you know, or just not getting restful sleep or just chronic pain in general. So what are one thing that you would tell them to start? I don't want to say treatment, but what are the, what is something that they should start thinking about? Like, Hey, maybe your sip apnea, maybe your headache, maybe from, you know, happening with your mouth. Like, what would you tell them? What would you tell this confused patient to think about? Sure. Um, I guess maybe two things, if that's all right. Of course. Hey, more, the better. So one common thing we hear many times is patients that have had poor sleep their whole life, they don't know that waking up multiple times in the night, because they've done it their whole life, they don't know that that's not a healthy presentation. So I guess to anyone listening, if, if you're out there and you're waking up through the night, maybe seek, seek a sleep study, sleep help, seek help from your primary care doctor. Um, but the other big thing that, that I think really w patterns well with what we're talking about in the work that you do is the importance of nasal breathing. I think historically in medicine, people said, oh, if you can't breathe through your nose and breathe through your mouth, it's not a big deal. But um, it, we have a lot of health benefits that come from nasal breathing. And so the more a person can teach themselves to become an efficient nose breather, keep lips together, keep tongue up, and it takes some practice for some people. Some people it might require the use of nose strips, nose cones, maybe saline rinses, whatever it takes to train you, yourself to become an efficient nasal breather. It can Im improve sleep quality. It can improve quality of life. For those who are listening, actually all my patients who are watching this, I hope now you have a world-renowned orthodontist and a dentist to tell you this, not just this little Cairo here tell you to the importance of nasal breathing. Thanks, Doc. What is the one tip? One tip. If you say like, hey, if they cannot find you, if whoever watching you is somewhere, you know, on the other side of the world or country, like, what would you tell them? Like, what's the one tip you would tell them? And what are some questions they should ask their local dentist about the things you do so they will find a dentist that actually understand what you do, Doc? Uh, I think kind of reflecting on those things, maybe asking questions like, do I have room for my tongue? Mm -hmm. um, are my jaws in the right position that I can easily keep my lips together? So for example, somebody that has a deficient mandible, they may struggle to keep their lips together. So they might present with TMJ pain, but it's the TMJ pain is because of a constant shifting of that lower jaw forward to keep their lips together. Um, and that's problematic and, and it can cause headaches and pain, poor sleep um, and wear and tear on the teeth, wear and tear on the condyle as well. So um, asking these questions, 
how is my sleep okay? And then if you were looking for a provider, can my provider help solve these problems, including creating space for the tongue, getting lips together, breathing through the nose. Gotcha. And now, and for those who are local in Seattle and Bellevue, so how can they find you online? And by the way, I'll put your website on the show notes, but yeah, where can they find, find you online, Doc? Oh, thank you. Our um, inspiredortho.com. Um, inspired, of course, of play on words with, with breathing. And, um, and we're in the medical dental building downtown, and then we're uh, close to Overlake Hospital in Bellevue. Gotcha. Thanks, Tom. As I said, like, uh, for audience, I'll put the uh, website of Dr. Backhouse uh, websites on the show notes as well. You know where to find them. So uh, before we close up, Doc, so uh, any last word for our audience here? Um, no, thank you so much. I, I applaud you and and how you're really reaching out and, and trying to be ex so so collaborative with, with uh, providers that maybe we, others would not think to collaborate with. So really, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Smooch, Doc. Uh, I think you can share that sentiment. At the end of the day, I always say it's not about us, it's about the patients. And I always believe, you know, rising tide raises all boats, and hopefully our patients or even a fellow provider who, fellow Cairo or PT who know about this, so they will start to get them to think about a little outside the box other than just looking at bone out of place or uh, this muscle is tight, you have to stretch. They can really get exposed to this. I always say, know better, be better. And again, we cannot do this without your generosity to so share your time and all the, uh, the knowledge with us. Too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys. So until next time, keep moving better to feel better. And if you have any sleep apnea problem, especially in you in Seattle and Bellevue, now you know who to look for. Again, Doc, thanks again for your time. Thank you.